Good evening, everyone. I wonder if I can welcome, welcome to you all to the, uh, the Great Hall of the University. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Guy Orpen. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Bristol, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. It's a, a special year for me. This has uh, just gone past the 40th anniversary of my time in Bristol as a uh, living and working here and, um, and becoming more and more in love with our city. So it's a big night for me and a big night for the university to welcome this event uh, to the Great Hall of the Wills Building. It's an annual event and one of the highlights of our year um, and it's a great pleasure to and welcome the people of Bristol uh, to hear uh, our Mayor Marvin Rees and to hear his, his State of the City address. It's the seventh of those State of the City addresses that the Mayor of Bristol has given in this hall and the University is delighted to have hosted them all. It is an enduring demonstration of the strong links we have with the elected Mayor and the people and our city collectively. It is also part of the Festival of the Future City biennial programme, uh, which itself is a part of the programme of the Festival of Ideas delivered by the Bristol Cultural Development Partnership and of which we are a particularly uh, enthusiastic and proud sponsor. So my congratulations to Andrew Kelly and all his colleagues for the work they've put into creating such a terrific festival starting today and running over the next couple of days. Well, it's perhaps a truism or a commonplace to observe that these are turbulent and difficult times for this country and indeed many countries around the world. Um, and it's important for me and I think for this university and universities like us to think about our role in, in such troubled times. I would argue that it's important for us to be truly civic, to be engaged with and for this, our cities, their regions and their people and organizations in particular. It's also important for a university like Bristol to be global in its concerns, its ability to speak to and hear from right around the planet and to understand the concerns of other communities elsewhere and to understand how we can contribute to solving problems that are of concern not just to local communities but to communities all around the world. If you will, I think our role is to be locally engaged and have impact on a global scale. In so doing, universities like ours need to have a dual role, both to be a source of expertise, capability and capacity, our staff and students acting for the wider public good, but also to be a, a, a good institutional citizen of the places that we are at the heart of. So to align our development and ambitions with those of the city region and to be proud in so doing and to be cognizant of the ambitions and needs of that city region. Examples of that in the last year or so, our Cabot Institute, the Environmental Research Institute of the University, has carried out on behalf of the city an evaluate, a voluntary local review of the city's progress in the UN Sustainable Development Goals to evaluate the progress of the city region towards the, those outcomes. We followed in the footsteps of our city council and declared a climate emergency in April, the first UK university so to do. And it's certainly woken up and are, are, are both the internal community within the university, but also our peers around the sector. Indeed, I was, I was at another university only yesterday explaining our work in that regard. I think it's also fair to say that there is compelling evidence as to the, the, the achievements we can, uh, we can make when we partner with our city. And, and that is manifest in the remarkable strides the university has made in the recent past. I'm particularly proud of the progress we've made in diversifying our student intake. The, the undergraduate cohort that arrived in the last month is the most diverse we've ever, ever been proud to host. And our Bristol Scholars Scheme, which is particularly focused on engagement with, with underrepresented communities in this city, is setting the standard in the United Kingdom and far beyond and attracting interest in how we've done it and how it's going. And it's going really well. Fantastic students blossoming at our university and setting us uh, on a different path, I'm pleased to say. On the research front, we've received the biggest research grant we have ever received to support the work of our Bristol Digital Futures Institute, uh, announced in July, and working with 
local and global industries and local communities and their organizations to understand what sort of digital future we need as a society, not simply what digital future might be thrust upon us. And earlier this week, the Combined Authority announced a further £20 million grant for our Quantum Technologies Innovation Centre and its disruptive technology offerings that can be delivered into the marketplace here in Bristol. There is a truly remarkable level of support from both the City Council and the West of England Combined Authority for that, for those propositions and the wider Temple Quarter Enterprise Campus uh, work that I'm personally uh, committed to and involved with, and which I sincerely expect and hope to be a flagship venue for the university and the city in the years and decades to come. So to close tonight, we're playing another part of our vital role of our, uh, as, a, as a civic institution by providing a venue for inclusive, respectful debate that society here and indeed around the world needs much more of. So welcome again, and thanks for coming to the university tonight to hear the State of the City address from the Mayor and others tonight. I'm just going to big up one of them, uh, Vanessa Kasule, because I'm triply proud to have her here performing tonight. She's Bristol City poet, the second in that uh, distinguished line. She's also a graduate of the University of Bristol, one of our most um, exciting, I would say. And finally, she's also one of our artists in residence for the Temple Quarter project, working with local communities to celebrate the regeneration of that area and to document its heritage. If you haven't already read or heard her poem, Out with the Old and In with the New, about the demolition of the old sorting office, now long gone and not much lamented, I urge you to take a look at her work. Uh, her seventh commission is tonight, her, her performance tonight, but before we get to hear that, I'd like to introduce our city's youth mayors who will come to the stage and tell you about their marvelous work. So please give it up for our city's youth mayors. I'm Sienna and this is Mohammed, and we are the Youth Mayors of Bristol. Um, the Youth Mayors of Bristol work closely alongside the Mayor advocating the youth voice as well as sitting on the Bristol City Youth Council and working closely with their campaigns. This year uh, the campaigns include Equal Bristol which has four main subgroups, BAME issues, LGBTQ plus issues, SEND issues and period poverty. Some of the other campaigns include Youth Voice, Environment and Transport, and Supported Mental Wellbeing. The Bristol City Youth Council are an elected group of young people aged 11 to 18. Each young members are voted in for by the Bristol Big Vote, in which each candidate makes a short video detailing their manifesto, and school children around Bristol then can then vote. The Youth Council aims to make sure children and young people can express their views on the decisions that are important to them and, that make and to make sure that their opinions are voiced and heard. We hope to make positive changes in our communities and make a difference to the young people of Bristol. Marvin has always been very supportive of the Youth Council and has many campaigns and pledges that support young people as part of the One City Plan. These include annual city-wide youth conferences to engage young people with the development of strategic city programmes, 100 Bristol companies pledging um, high quality work experience and reducing the gap between children in mo the most deprived areas and areas achieving a good level of development at early years foundation stage. So for our term as youth mayors we are focused on two main areas, holiday hunger and knife crime with a particular emphasis on young people's attendance in their places of education. As youth mayors this summer we have been attending some of the many schemes across Bristol attempting to try and lessen the detrimental impact of holiday hunger. Um, this included an inter intergenerational breakfast and a climate change themed project providing free lunch. We have also been looking into the best ways to help to, help to try to tackle this, tackle this issue during the Christmas period. In terms of attendance rate and knife crime, we believe that the attendance rate of each individual student is important because students are more likely to succeed in academics when they attend school consistently. consistently. However, improved attendance rate also means less young people are on the streets and with increased attendance, more students can have their mental and physical well-being monitored. And we both believe that it is fundamental that the young people of Bristol's well-being is closely monitored in order for everyone to reach their full potential and not feel lost in an ever-increasingly pressured society. 
We are very grateful for this position elected by the youth of Bristol and we are, and we are so happy that Bristol as a city is listening, to the, is listening to the youth and taking action. Now on with tonight. Uh, firstly, we'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. We have an exciting agenda which will start with a fly through of the future city by View City. We will then welcome our city poet Vanessa Casule to the stage. We, are, we will then watch a, bris a video called We Are Bristol, sh showcasing what makes our city special and unique. Bristol City Mayor Marvin Rees will, will then take to the stage to share his State of the City address. Following that, there will be a Q&A and a panel session debating the future of the cities, uh, cities around the world. So, let's begin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, can you all hear me? Right, right in the back, can I get a wave of affirmation? Hey, everyone's with me, fantastic. Um, it's really, really amazing to be here with all of you. Um, and I won't go on and on, there's lots of things I want to say, but I just wanted to tell you a little about how humbling it's been to learn so much about this city under this city poet role. One thing I didn't want to do was just rattle off a load of poems from my perspective about the city because to be quite frank with you, how I perceive it is just one drop in the ocean and of course, as we saw across that map, there's, there's so many different areas, so many different communities um, and people have very different lived experiences of this city, some brilliant, some not so good and I feel that it's my duty as an artist to, to honour that and be honest about all these different experiences and try where I can to speak to them and also let others speak for themselves. So I've been doing a lot of work in different areas. I've been in local libraries. Um, I've done lots of work in Lawrence Hill in the Barton Hill settlement. Um, I've spoken to lots of people about their experiences in Bristol, the things that they like and the things they wanna see change. And one of the people that did approach me um, who wanted to work with me in a capacity uh, was a group in St. George that are working around air pollution in Bristol. And we have some of the most concerning rates of air pollution um, in the UK. Um, and seeing what's going on with Extinction Rebellion and um, the climate emergencies that are being declared across the world, I felt that this was something I wanted to address in this poem today. So some, some fears that I have, but also some tentative hopes for how we might address um, air pollution, climate change, um, and also just making this city more livable for everyone. And these are all very complex issues, and I, I wouldn't claim to have the answers. But um, from my humble artist perspective, here's a piece that I wrote, and I hope that it strikes a chord with you all today. The cars cough tar and the air hangs thick. The trees sigh slow as our kids get sick. Our fears hang loose as the warped clock tocks. It tock tick tocks as our slack jaws lock. We flex our wrists and we clear our throats. Heads come together, we try to see what floats. We swallow our fear, though it haunts our ribs. Solemn vows of change hang heavy on lips. The cars cough tar and the air hangs thick. The birds sing grief and our mouths house grit. Some thick, fat tongues speak sound bite clouds. We have no faith in these empty sounds. We drive through town in our speed-shaped shells, then drive back home overwhelmed by smells. The cars cough tar and the close air gasps. Will this now be Bristol's epitaph? We can't hang back. And we can't give up, can't lean on chance or rely on luck. We must serve all, not just Clifton folk. It's the poorest parts that will feel the choke. Think broad and fair. It is bigger than just us. Those on the edge matter just as much. Give the homeless hope, don't just move them on. They too have pride and the right to belong. The streets are ours, so let's treat them so. Do not think dark, where there's light, there's growth. Let's dust off bikes and our walking shoes. Make all streets safe so we all can walk through. But change must come from our leaders first, for they hold the strings to the public purse. In Lawrence Hill, parents can't catch trains. No ramps for prams and no signs of change. 
If we must ditch all the toxic cars, we need cheap travel to get near and far. The bus must be on budget and on time. The bike route smooth as a seamless rhyme. We dream big dreams for the kids we've birthed and sow them seeds in the patient dirt. Perhaps naive to believe in more, but live on we must. But what on earth for? To stroll in groups in the rain and sun as the kids breathe deep and the sweet air hums. Our pathways wide as the trees are tall, the city's lungs swelling as a new dawn calls. Thank you. We are learners, we are grafters, we are blue, we are red, we are lovers, we are fighters, we are waiting, we are moving, we are rising. We are down, we are pioneers, we are entrepreneurs, we are young, we are wise, we are stereotyped, we are judged, we are loud, we are proud. We are caring, we are decent, we are different, we are the same, we are Bristol. We are Bristol. Incredible film by uh, Wishmaster and Patchell. So, uh, recently, I spent the afternoon at one of the holiday hunger schemes uh, we had going in Bristol. Uh, Feed Bristol gave out over 60,000 meals this summer, serving some of the tens of thousands of children we know are likely to go without food. Now, the staff told us about a mother. The week before, she had quietly approached one of the volunteers asking if there was any leftover food. She stressed she was not going to eat the food herself, but it was for her children. She had no food in the house and £2.50 to get through the weekend to the Monday. Forty years ago, my mum and I were facing the same challenges. So I'll set the scene. When my mum fell pregnant with me, she was an unmarried working-class white woman with a brown baby on the way. Health workers pressured her to have me aborted. When I was born, she was told if she was a good woman, she would give me up for adoption. But incidentally, when I was born, if I share a little story, my mum could hear I was born under a wandering star playing in the background from Lee Marvin's film, Paint Your Wagon. And he was drunk in the film with a red face, and when I came out, I had a very red face, hence the name Marvin. That's where it comes from. <laughs> so. But the theme set in those first months continued through my childhood. We eventually moved to a refuge in Devon before moving back to Bristol on the Long Cross Estate and then Eastern. Throughout those years, my mum went without food herself so I could eat. We struggled, and much of my childhood was clouded with a faint unhappiness. Now, I was blessed in that I had a loving family, my nan and granddad, my auntie Glenis, my cousins, Dennis and Anthony, and we had a supportive church. But life was tough. And what I want to say today is, this is Bristol. Now, it's not the whole of Bristol. We are the city of culture, creativity, sustainability, rebellion, 
advanced manufacturing, world-class universities and aerospace, the city that justifiably uh, prides itself on doing things differently and makes a net contribution to Her Majesty's Treasury. In fact, we are a city of contrasts and contradictions, of inequality, where wealth sits alongside poverty and hope sits alongside hopelessness. Now, I deliberately put those two visions of Bristol in that order because too often the Bristol of the left behind comes after the story of the Bristol of success. Now, as, my, as a mayor, it is my job to advance our city's successes, but it is the fullness of my role as a city leader to ensure we understand that our true greatness will be found in our collective commitment to making Bristol a city in which everyone can find hope in that success, irrespective of the circumstances of their birth. Now, I've long been committed to the idea of hope, in part because it is so much more mature than optimism. Hope doesn't refuse to see suffering and challenge. It engages with them so that they become an opportunity to develop perseverance, which produces character, and character is the pathway to hope. And our city must also be a hope for the world. Uh, we are an international city, a global people of 92 languages and 180 countries of origin. What happens in the world, be it an earthquake in Kashmir, a typhoon in Biera, the displacement of the Rohingya from Myanmar, uh, families drowning in the Mediterranean, all Black Lives Matter in the United States. Our people have an emotional, cultural and blood connections to those stories. And our influence must extend to leadership on the critical issues of our time, climate emergency, the migration crisis and the rise of reactionary right-wing politics. So I say tinkering around the edges of what Bristol is and what we do is not enough. Snatching small victories, a junction here, a traffic light there is not enough. For too many years, we haven't had the kind of change Bristol has needed. The city have tinkered around with transport for decades and the result is a transport system that is failing the city. We have tinkered around on housing. The result is our housing crisis with 500 families in temporary accommodation, 12,000 on the waiting list, and tens of thousands more wondering if they'll ever have their own home. And to these challenges today, add the Brexit threat to our economy and jobs. The fact that national government at its best has gone missing, and at its worst is making people poorer through policies such as universal credit. That Bristol will grow by nearly 100,000 people over the coming 25 years that we have unprecedented levels of inequality and a loss of faith in public institutions, and we have the climate emergency. The scale of these challenges present both the opportunity and demand for change. At the C40 summit last week, Vice President Al Gore said we need changes in policy and changes in the people who make policy. Now in Bristol, this will mean changes in the way the city sets priorities, operates and looks as we regenerate the city. It means greater diversity of the people who take up positions of leadership and an explicit commitment to ensure the economy works for people and planet rather than treating them as mere factors of production. The Bristol of old just did not deliver. We can no longer afford to carry the old order. We need the next iteration of Bristol. I warn too that doing nothing doesn't mean things will, see, will stay the same. If we do not proactively design the next iteration of Bristol, we will find ourselves increasingly on the back foot, responding to challenges that are out of our control with a city that is ill-equipped for the task. But when I look around the city today, I see the start of the change. We have cranes on the horizon and the collaboration of the city office and the One City Plan. We have the declaration of the climate emergency. We have City Leap and a city commitment to inclusive economic development. Evidence of the change we are bringing is in that my cabinet and I have actually delivered the commitments we made to you, Bristol, in 2016. So first, we said we would build 2,000 new homes, at least 800 affordable a year by 2020. Many people said to me this target was unachievable and we knew ourselves it was a stretch. 
but we are on course to hit it and even succeed it, exceed it. Developments underway across the city right now include the ambulance station, Wapping Wharf, the paintworks, Hartcliffe campus, the Launchpad housing scheme, the Z-Pods housing scheme being built above a St. George car park. We have houses being built in some of the most deprived neighbourhoods in the city. In Hengrove at Hengrove Park, in Lotlees at Romney House, Sheldon Road, Bonnington Walk. In Southmead at Dunmel. In Henbury, we are building council houses in Richardson Close, as we are in Alderman's Moor in Ashton Vale. At the recent Built Environment Network conference, Kelly Hillman, who's head of landscape acquisitions at Homes England, said Bristol is leading the way in the UK with planning, the environment, and effecting positive change. And she said this was down to the city leadership. The cultural change we've brought to our leadership and our strong grip of council finances has enabled us to turn Bristol City Council into a housing delivery organisation focused on delivering sustainable and affordable homes. We've committed 82% of our five-year capital program, that's £857 million to infrastructure investment, including homes and redevelopment schemes such as Temple Quarter and Temple Mead Station. We committed £85 million to accelerate home building and £61 million for Gorham Homes, our new housing company. And this year, our housing revenue account has £15.7 million freed up to invest in building council homes. Secondly, we said we would deliver work experience and apprenticeships. When I came into power, 56% of young people in Bristol were not getting access to meaningful work experience. We've changed that. Through the works programme and the commitment of city employers, 3,500 meaningful experiences of work are being delivered to young people in Bristol this year alone. And this year, youth options, this year is Youth Options Year with a series of events and activities and workshops supporting young people to engage with employers and trainers and take up opportunities with confidence. This, I say, is hope in action. Raising aspiration, opening doors of opportunity, supporting young people onto the right track. Third, we promised we would stop the expansion of RPZs and review existing schemes. And we did it. Working with local councillors in each area, RPZs were reviewed and revised, and we now are engaging with residents in new areas about new schemes, and we'll work with communities where there is overwhelming export for their implementation. Fourth, we pledged to protect children's centres. And despite the devastating austerity programme, we kept them all open. The national picture is of a £3.1 billion funding gap contributing to the closure of more than 1,000 children's centres and a further 722 no longer offering the full range of services. But in Bristol, children's centres will remain at the heart of our offer to families. Fifth, we told the city we would increase school places with a fair admissions process. Now, we've committed £25 million to a new school in Loch Lees. A new secondary school in Silverthorne Lane, Silverthorne Lane is in progress that will serve children from the centre and east of the city. And there will be a new school in the south, in Knoll West. It is unheard of to be delivering three schools at once, but we're doing it. We're delivering on our promise to parents and we will continue to build and expand yet more schools as our population grows. We, six, we made a promise to put Bristol on course to be run entirely on clean energy by 2050 and introduce a safe clean streets campaign. And we've accelerated this promise, taking steps for Bristol to be run on clean energy and to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. We launched City Leap, a £1 billion investment package that will transform Bristol's relationship with energy. And we're extending Bristol clean streets, including fines for offenders, smart bins, and we've launched the Big Tidy, which will deploy crews to deep, clean city hotspots. And seventh, we committed to lead a European Capital of Culture bid and promised to make culture and sport accessible to all. Now, Brexit got in the way of this one, but we still delivered on our commitment. We secured UNESCO's City of Film status through a collaboration of the Bristol Film Office, the University of the West of England, University of Bristol, Screenology, 
Destination Bristol and Bottle Yard Studios. We underwrote £48.8 million for the redevelopment of Colston Hall and £1.5 million to enable the modernisation of the Bristol Old Vic and St George's. And we overcame over 30 other towns and cities to be chosen as a new home for Channel 4, who are opening their offices in Bristol later this month. And on sport, we protected pitches for grassroots sport and are working with Sports England and local clubs to increase sports hall provision. And our gatherings have brought together people like never before to find opportunities to improve participation, support talent to development, and bring world-class sport and events to the city. That's called keeping your promises. And I'm delighted to be able to share with you and demonstrate delivery for the city. But of course, we didn't stop there with those, that short list of pledges. And we've delivered so much more. So I'll give you a brief rundown of some of our achievements. But I wanted to start by expressing my gratitude uh, to my hardworking and dedicated cabinet, to my office team, to the city council uh, leadership and workforce, to our city partners, um, and also to my Labour colleagues who have delivered a budget year on year in the face of political opposition that's made all this possible. Bristol really is a collective endeavour. So we have the Parks Prospectus now and new funding for tree planting as part of our city plan commitment to double the tree canopy in Bristol by 2045. The Stepping Up programme has delivered training and development for 104 participants from BME backgrounds and women and disabled people. 70% of the first, first cohort have gone on to get promotions and so far 46% of the second cohort uh, we also now have a cohort of 35 Somali women, 25 of whom have now gone on to get jobs. This is economic inclusion being delivered. The Bristol, City, the Bristol Equality Charter successfully launched with 70 signatories to the Bristol Equality Network and the LGBT Plus Voice and Influence Partnership. The Reading City project with an army of volunteers and ambassadors targeting communities with the highest need is fully underway. And of course, we kept all of our libraries open. We have led on period poverty and have been now been invited to be part of the government task force. We continue to develop the strengthening families work as part of the ACES program and Bristol Thrive with an emphasis on early intervention, prevention, mental and physical health and resilience. Learning from Glasgow, we've taken a public health approach to street violence and knife crime to prevent the worst of what we've seen elsewhere. Children with special educational needs have been neglected by, gov by government and we recognise they've been badly treated and badly served by the city. But going forward, we must stand with families and put that right for their children, and we will. We have delivered extra care housing started in Stockwood and Stoke Gifford. Our home first service is supporting people to return home quicker after a hospital stay, reducing readmissions, and we are paying care workers the living wage and for their travel time. We are using technology to support independent living for disabled and older people. Care leavers up to the age of 25 are now exempt from council tax, and we are the only core city to have retained a 100% council tax reduction scheme. We are creating the first project to provide housing for the young homeless, care leavers and students in partnership with United Communities, 1625 Independent People and Bristol University. We have prioritised housing for women uh, escaping domestic violence and abuse. We opened a 24-hour homeless shelter in St Anne's, which has just opened for its second winter. We will pilot the closure of school streets during drop-off and pick-up times. And we safeguarded the future of Schema's boxing gym in Noel West. And YTL will continue to receive our support as they deliver a state-of-the-art 17,000-seater Bristol arena, ready to come to planning in the next few months. And it's worth pointing out, in doing so, we have saved public money and carbon emissions compared to the original plans. Instead of producing and trucking thousands of tonnes of steel and concrete, it's being built with the best carbon neutral solution, retrofitting an existing building. 
We have brought together key players as part of our commitment to Bristol's nightlife with clear proposals to safeguard music venues. We established the City Centre Revitalisation Group in the face of major challenges to city centres and retail across the country. And we are building a new household waste and reuse centre in Avonmouth and are on track to deliver the new recycling and reuse centre on Hartcliffe Way. I could go on. But without any great fanfare, the single biggest change uh, is the change in governance. We have worked with the city to develop a city plan that sets out Bristol's future to 2050, transcending the electoral cycle. We have set up the city office to oversee the plan. This is a move from local government and a focus on the workings of the council to city governance, which means working together with all the city's institutions and decision makers. We have shared city leadership with six thematic boards made up of partners from right across the city, each taking responsibility for shaping and updating their piece of the Bristol One City Plan. Therein is inclusive, cross-organisational work going on in a way it never has. And we have the city funds, which will be investing in agreed city priorities with ethical investment and giving at its heart. The significance of these innovations should not be underestimated. These successes have been recognised around the world from the EU's iCapital Awards to the Financial Times and Reuters. Now all of these achievements can't be taken for granted. Delivery has not previously been the norm and sustaining the city office and the One City Plans needs the new form of political leadership we have brought. But let me share a few reflections. It means delivery being delivery focused. You would be surprised how often we have come into conflict with processes that prioritise the structures rather than outcomes for people. Secondly, it means we must go beyond the transactional relationship between candidate and voters, where a candidate promises a, a couple of projects to purchase a vote. Our offer as an administration is this, a working relationship built on a shared set of priorities and values and a commitment to delivering against them. A third reflection is just to emphasise the fact that complexity is not a vice. This is a complicated city in a complicated world. Now, plans, uh, campaigns are already gearing up that will be about 10-word sound bites on leaflets. But cities cannot be run with approaches built on 10-word analyses. Once you've got those 10 words, you need the next 10, and then the next 10. Bristol needs leadership that grapples with the reality of that complexity and acknowledges that sometimes good things can have negative consequences for some people. And I think we're seeing in Donald Trump a living demonstration that meaningful leadership and debate cannot be conducted through 280-word character uh, Twitter posts. And on this last point, we urgently in Bristol need an improvement in the quality of our civic discourse. The misinformation and attempts to reduce nuanced issues to binary options really underserves us. The truth is there are positives, negatives, risks and uncertainties to most options we face. Despite what you might hear and read, the scale of collaboration in the city in name of getting things done is of far greater relevance than any conflict that centres around the council chamber. The city is in the business of getting stuff done while the Chamber wants to stay focused on division and our media are stuck with the clickbait of pointless point scoring and 30 second sound bites of opposition. WC Field said, I never voted for anyone, I just opposed. And we are in the danger of turning that quip into a city reality. So let me, off the back of that, let me share with you what I see coming in the next few months. I hope I'm wrong. Now I used to play a lot of rugby and what we found was, if you're up against a team that is better than you, you want rain, a muddy pitch, and you want a scrap, all right? You don't want them playing rugby, and you want them to get into that scrap. That's the leveler. Now, over the coming months, and I hope you demand better, some people want to throw mud in this election, and they'll want to get us in a back alley scrap and confuse the issues. But for us, 
we will stay focused on the fact that we have delivered and built a new city leadership, restored the, financials, uh, the council's financial credibility, and will continue to focus on the issues that matter to people. As Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we will go high. And for our commitment, we're going to be focused on positive politics. Now, as I said, Bristol is a collective endeavour. Good leadership is about not being afraid to have Premier League people around you. It's about finding great people who want to make things happen and giving them the space and the backing to get it done. And so many people have been a part of our city leadership. People like the, Lor the late Lorraine Bush at Hawkesbury. She got things done. She touched lives. She liked to say, life is measured not by how much you love, but how much you are loved. And she went out there and did things that got her loved. Like Paul Hassan does with local communities, and Jess Sweetland leading the innovation at, through the Bristol Housing Festival. Marty Burgess, who brings expertise and entrepreneurialism to so many things in Bristol. Dick Penny, who has done so much for our city's cultural offer. People like Sado Jurde of Black Southwest Network. Mohammed El Sharif, who made Bristol his family home after fleeing Sudan and has done so much to contribute to the civic life of this city. Kas Majothi and his son Rashid, who fled Amin's Uganda, founded Sweet Mart at the heart of the re that's been at the heart of the regeneration of St. Mark's Road in Easton. Silas Crawley, supporting men leaving prison. Gene Smith, Chief Executive of Nalari, doing so much on drugs and mental health in the inner city. And I have to mention my old youth leader, Dennis Stinchcombe from Riverside, who plays such a huge role in mine and the, the lives of so many other young people in Bristol. And on that front too, I want to thank our international ambassadors here tonight, Chris Saniger, Caroline Hassan, and Ivor Anderson, aka DJ Bungie, who have championed our city on the world stage. And off that, I'd like tonight to welcome our new international ambassadors, Dr. Mina Fombo, uh, founder of Black Girl Convention, and Silas Adekunle, co-founder of Reach Robotics. And I know that they are gonna be fantastic champions for us on the global stage. Now with a council fit for purpose, city partners fully engaged, and a plan to deliver, these could be exciting times. Delivery for people on homes, transport, uh, jobs, and the environment is gonna be at the center of our future. Now our homes targets will be met, and we will meet the challenge of building them in a way and in places that minimize our carbon footprint. The plans for the Western Harbour are central to our ambition. How and where we build homes will be one of the biggest determinants of our climate impact over the coming years. A recent report on climate change by Robert Mugger for the World Economic Forum uh, tells cities they need to build centrally, more densely and higher to reduce demands on energy through more efficient buildings and reducing dependency on cars. It's in that context that Western Harbour represents around 2,000 homes to help us tackle our housing crisis within a seven minute bike ride and a 25 minute walk of the city centre. We also have the opportunity to introduce flood defence at the same time and so in sympathy with the development. Uh, it means life being brought into the city centre to support the retail offer in the city centre and that of North Street. And it means the opportunity to turn the waterfront into a destination accessible for all. And we'll deliver on other major infrastructure and housing projects, from the Temple Quarter to St. Philip's Marsh and climate resilient housing in, at the Froome Gateway alongside the University Campus and Temple Island. And we will develop uh, the St. James area of the city. Also within our grasp is a truly transformative transport solution. We start with a bus deal that will double services on key routes as well as regular commuter services down main arterial routes. Uh, this is public investment in prioritization and infrastructure that will trigger private investment in services as the first step towards making public transport the mode of choice. This will bring greater reliability and connectivity with a loop service, a circle line that will connect the city central areas of Broadmead and Cabot Circus to the centre, 
Redcliffe, Temple Meads and Old Market every few minutes. Uh, through traffic, we'll, pass the city, we'll bypass the city centre areas completely. This will enable the pedestrianisation of the old city and the city centre. This will deliver cleaner air, safe spaces for walking and cycling while supporting our local economy, jobs and connectivity. And then we will deliver the mass transit system, a promise to the city that is both deliverable and essential if we're to offer a real alternative to the car. Uh, developed within the next decade, this will bring four lines of mainly underground, low carbon, rapid and reliable mass transit. The first line will connect Temple Meads to the airport, looping through the south of Bristol, connecting employment people to jobs and opportunity. The next line will connect the northern fringe from Kibbs, Cribs Causeway to the centre and the south and east central areas of the city. And then we will connect to the east, going as far as Light Green and Hicks Gate. And by also enhancing and growing our urban rail network, these plans will transform public transport. We will work closely with our local authority neighbours and with the combined authority, but we must not and we will not face away from the ambition and the transformative impact of these plans. And to deliver jobs for everyone, we need investment and we must grow a diverse economy. We are working with seven cities and their surrounding regions to build an economic powerhouse for the West. This is supported by government departments, local economic partnerships, uh, businesses and city leaders and links with the emerging National 2070 Plan. This will bring the Western region of England and Wales to the top table for government and international investment in the way the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine has for their areas. And with the support of unions and business, we will make Bristol a living wage city where well-paid, decent jobs are the benchmark, not the aspiration. And by protecting employment land in key areas, we will promote business and diversify our economy. While our high-tech sectors grow and prosper, so we have a fundamental need to protect and grow jobs in all sectors, including food, care and retail. And Bristol has been a leading voice on the UK's response to the climate emergency. The first council to declare a climate emergency. The first to embed leadership of the new Green Deal with a named cabinet lead. The first UK city to undertake a voluntary local review against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The driver of a motion to the local government association which saw 435 councils uh, declare uh, a climate emergency and commit to the SDGs. Okay. We'll keep going. But declarations and motions are only the first step. The climate emergency requires action. We have the action plan which has been published today on the Council's website. From setting a groundbreaking ambition for a carbon neutral and climate resilient city by 2030, to driving forward a £1 billion programme of investment in cleaner, greener energy, to progressing the actions requested of councils by Friends of the Earth, we are telling the truth about climate emergency and acting now to tackle it, in concert with the link challenge of social justice. We will finalise our local plan to ensure our planning policies match our ambition. New planning policy will drive zero carbon buildings, affordable housing, community self-build and appropriate student developments. We will find a way to make Bristol plastic, a plastic-free city and we are going for gold on food sustainability and have plans with the Avon Wildlife Trust and food growing groups to establish local food growing in every ward in the city, tackling food poverty while protecting wildlife habitats. Now, to just to finish off, it's worth just sharing that City Hall is about to install a blue plaque, declaring Bristol a city of hope. Now, it was presented to Bristol at the July City Gathering in recognition of what we have all been doing um, and, and actually challenging us to keep going uh, on the things we have been doing for the people of Bristol. Now, we have the opportunity to make Bristol a better place for all citizens of all ages throughout their lives. From childcare and children's centres to more and better schools, 
a diverse, inclusive and sustainable economy with jobs for all, a transport system that, system that is fit for purpose, connecting people and jobs and cleaning our air, to keeping people in their own homes with better support. To deliver that city, we need to continue the change we've started. Now, I started tonight by telling a story of a Bristol mum who was struggling to feed her children today. And I shared that 40 years ago, my mum was facing the same struggle. We don't want to be telling that story again in 40 years. We have the opportunity now to make Bristol a better place to live and work for all our citizens. Let's continue to change. Let's do it together. Thank you. As it's Festival of the Future City, um, we have benefit from many international visitors and tonight we have five of them who have been speaking during the festival. Um, I'm going to be discussing with them certain points that came out of the Mayor's State of the City address uh, and um, some more general points about cities as we go through. I should point out that a number of questions were submitted as we usually do each year for the, the Mayor's State of the City Address. And the Mayor has agreed that um, answers to those questions will be sent next week to people who submitted them. I want to introduce the panel that we have with us tonight. Sheila Foster on my left, Georgetown University, Chair of the Advisory Committee, Global Parliament of Mayors, and a recent member of the New York Panel on Climate Change. Um, next is um, Lola, um, Lola Shanayin, a novelist, poet, Ake Arts and Books Festival, Lagos, Nigeria. Eche Temul Kiran, one of Turkey's best known novelists and political commentators, and author most recently of How to Lose a Country, The Seven Steps from Democracy to Dictatorship. Bruno Masais, um, author, Hudson Institute, author most recently of The Dawn of Eurasia and Belt and Road, A Chinese World Order and Tony Pippa from the Brookings Institution. Tony, I want to start with you. The, the Mayor referred to climate change, climate emergencies and SDGs. What can cities particularly offer when it comes to sustainable development goals? Well, as, uh, as the Secretary General um, just talked about at C40, I mean, the battle for climate will be won and lost with cities. Uh, more than 70% of the emissions worldwide uh, happen within cities. Um, and I think what's very interesting and what's happening here in Bristol, as the mayor uh, suggested, Bristol is one of the, was the first city in the UK to do a voluntary local review against the sustainable development goals. Now, how, how many folks in the audience are aware of the sustainable development goals? Just a show of hands. Wow, this is great. <laughs> this does not happen in the United States. Right. <laughs> um, kudos, kudos to you. And so you're familiar with it. You know that the Sustainable Development Goals are, were, were negotiated by countries uh, under the auspices of the United Nations. And so the, the benchmarks and the targets are set at the national and global levels. But these are really aspirations that affect people's lives. And so I think it's up to cities to make them real in real communities, to solve real problems for real people in communities. I was on a panel recently, and, and somebody on the panel was talking about how cities compete in this day and age. And they talk about competing for people, competing for businesses, competing for tourists. And the basis for that competition in the 21st century is sustainability. But when you look at the sustainable development goals, sustainability is not just climate change, and it's not just environmental sustainability, but it is also issues of social justice. It is issues of security and violence, issues of inequality and poverty, and the complexity that the mayor was talking about. Um, and so putting all those together and attacking those issues in multi-dimensional fashion, being intentional about reaching out to communities that have been left behind, and ensuring that when you're greening the city and you're looking for the green economy, uh, and when you're looking to go carbon neutral by 2030, that you're doing in a way that prosperity actually uh, is inclusive and reaches those people who might not have benefited from the global economy. I think is, is, uh, it's both uh, pioneering and groundbreaking, 
but it is also what we need to be thinking about. It's the vision of what our communities need to look like over the next 30 to 40 years. And so doing a voluntary local review, collecting the data that holds your feet to the fire and is accountable and transparent and saying, here's how well we're doing on these issues here, here's how well uh, we have, uh, here's how far we have to go on some of them, and to look at the complexity of those issues together and how they integrate together. Uh, I think is really important, and I think it's an important commitment. Bristol is not only the first UK city to do a voluntary local review, but it puts them actually in a handful of cities worldwide, cities like New York, LA, Helsinki, Buenos Aires, but it's still a very small group, and so it's a, it's a group that's pioneering this in, in the Vanguard. And it's worth mentioning that tomorrow in Festival Future City, we are looking at examples from New York and from LA and other places as well. Um, Sheila, the mayor talked about leadership. You've been involved in the Global Parliament of Mayors. Tell us about the Global Parliament of Mayors and about the role of leadership in cities. Yeah, so uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Wonderful. Very inspiring. I'm inspired by the mayor's speech, um, and he really is an example of the leadership that mayors are, are taking on a, on a global level. The Global Parliament of Mayors is an idea by a political scientist, Dr. Ben Barber, who wrote a book called If Mayors Ruled the World. And his vision was a parliament of just mayors in an era when nation states are increasingly dysfunctional and, uh, and, and cities are increasingly the places, as we've just heard, where um, uh, problems are being solved. Now, that's a bit of an overstatement, perhaps, but, but a few things are clear. Uh, number one is that almost every problem we face is happening in cities today for the simple fact that most of us live in cities and metro areas. Most of economic GDP is being produced in cities. Um, issues like housing, migration, economic inequality, connecting people to jobs, all of this is happening on a local level. So the idea of the parliament of mayors is that the people that are most engaged in solving these issues when nation states are pulling back or retreating on them, um, and, more, and most importantly, most closest to the people that are impacted by all of these problems and are working hand in hand with their residents on solving them, that those folks should have a say in what our international institutions and national leaders are doing and how they're distributing resources, for instance, to solve these problems. As one mayor has famously said, that mayors and cities are often on the menu but rarely at the table. And I think that's right. So, uh, so the Parliament of Mayors, um, what are now over uh, 200 international city networks like uh, C40, uh, really, I think, represent a shift in global politics and agenda setting, and it, it, and it is really mayors like uh, Marvin Rees that are um, at the forefront of solving what used to be problems that were addressed by national leaders. Um, uh, and, and so he mentioned um, uh, President Trump, our own president. Uh, when President Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, where nation states set national goals, um, strikingly, in the New York Times, the mayor of Paris the mayor, and the mayor of Pittsburgh wrote an op-ed that said, cities will get it done. And what we've seen is that cities are getting it done. Same on migration, same on housing and other crises. So the GPM, as we call it, and which, in fact, the city of Bristol hosted last year, um, is um, a forum for mayors to, to, uh, to, uh, to argue about these uh, or debate these questions really deliberate on solutions, and then to actually vote, take action, and, and talk to international leaders at the UN, at the IMF, at World Bank, and have a say in how our collective problems get solved with input from all of you who work with mayors. I'm gonna ask everyone later on about leadership and so on, but I want to pursue some of the other points. Bruno, you've been looking at cities, the new cities, of the, the Belt and Road and so on. I mean, what, t tell us about what these new cities are like um, and, and what cities, traditional Western cities, for example, can do to, to, to meet the competition of them. Gigantic new cities, uh, machines purpose-made for competing in the global arena. 
uh, in that sense, uh, rather terrifying, and they pose a challenge to what are, in some, in some cases, I think Bristol is a case of that, cities that go back to the past, that have a strong identity, that are not too big, that want to preserve that identity. Uh, I thought it was interesting that a mayor started with the stories of pain and despair, and only then turned to the stories of hope and power and prestige. Uh, and I want to do a little bit of the same. I want to point out that Bristol is privileged. Maybe you don't think that with your problems every day, but some time ago I was in Jakarta for a couple of, of, of weeks, uh, two months ago. Uh, I was in the capital of Somaliland, Argeza. Just yeah. last week I was in Rhodes, which is also privileged, but still is a city that depends 97% of tourism and cannot raise prices and taxes because it loses tourism revenue and has waves of refugees arriving from Syria. So it's a tough world out there, uh, and Bristol has to compete. What I worry about, and uh, I want to make this point uh, uh, also to, to the mayor, uh, this need to compete, this need to be as productive, as efficient, uh, as uh, modern, as future-oriented as you possibly can, has the danger that cities start to be thought of almost as smart gadgets, they have to be up to the latest standard. They all start to resemble each other. I see that in China a lot. Uh, they lose their past and their identity because that's the only way to survive and to be successful. And I wonder what we can do about that. Sometimes I think public authorities, local authorities think that it's up to the people to preserve the identity of Bristol and up to the authorities to make it competitive. But I would say that you know people alone cannot do that. Uh, and we need cities as a whole, and we need local authorities to also be concerned, among all the other goals that the mayor listed, and they're all very important, about preserving the identity, the uniqueness, the special character of a city like Bristol, and not leave it to chance, because if it's left to chance, it might not survive. And, and just give us a couple of examples of these. Just give us a couple of examples of these, these new cities that you've, you've, you've encountered. Sorry, I think Just give us a couple of examples of the, these new cities. Uh, you have cities of about a, a million population, for example, Forest City in Malaysia, being built on an artificial island, destroying the natural life of, of the Singapore Straits. You have a city like uh, Horgus being built in the steppes uh, in the middle of Central Asia, uh, but being meant to be to connect Europe and Asia together. You have Sianukville, which is not entirely new, but is being rebuilt on top of the whole Sianukville. And this is a city that has been delivered to criminal rings, to prostitution, to gambling. There are more casinos than, uh, than hospitals, certainly. Um, it, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a sort of a brave new world of gigantic new cities. Uh, in a way, exciting, and we want to see this future, <coughs> but also uh, rather terrifying. Okay. Um, Eche, the mayor talked about a decline in trust, and you've spent a lot of time looking at issues of democracy, how cities yeah. move, how, how nations move from democracy to dictatorship. Where, where do you think we are now with, with this? I mean, it, it's difficult to generalize, I know, but, you know, you're not allowed, for example, to go back home to Turkey. You know. Let's not talk about Let's that. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so tell us about the, the state of democracy then. Um, I think besides other things uh, mentioned before, uh, also democracy is in the hands of cities at the moment. Um, we lost our trust in democracies for good, for, for, for understandable reasons. First, since 1980s, uh, democracies are uh, stripped of social justice everywhere uh, on this side of Atlantic and on the other side of Atlantic, and then they were you know, expected to be profitable as well. Uh, so the underclass, the poor, were not represented. So there is a crisis of representation, especially since end of 70s. But now we have a brand new crisis, uh, which is post-truth, and we don't know how we're going to use the social media in our democracies. We have 21st century gadgets and communication techno technologies but we couldn't integrate them into 20th century democratic institutions. And these uh, social media communication tools are not strong enough, are not mature enough yet to transform the 20th century democratic institutions. So we are in a limbo at the moment. 
And uh, we thought it is ironic that we can use our iPhones uh, to vote for Britain Got Talent on TV, but we cannot use our iPhones for our democracies. We have, like good old times, we have to go to the ballot box and put the ballot in and so on. So we, don't, we are in between things at the moment, and that is understandable. But also, we are in the crisis, we are living, going, we are going through the crisis of neoliberalism, or to put it more bluntly, capitalism. Even Financial Times said that capitalism needs a reset. <coughs> Sorry, but however, we do not know how to do this reset on national, global levels. That is why I think cities uh, are trying to um, cure the wounds that na nations and international institutions have opened. So it is a very hard job for a city to cure the wound of refugees, uh, to cure the wound of social injustice, the gap of income, and so on and so forth. But this is also, I think, an, ad uh, you know, an advantage, because uh, democracy is not a pretty thing. It's not a boring thing either. Democracy is people coming together, confronting, going through antagonism, hating each other basically, and then somehow making a decision. And these, uh, since we cannot still use the 21st century communication tools, we, cities are the places that we can come together, see each other face to face, and talk to each other, and make decisions for the good of the people and to heal the wounds of the 21st century that are opened by big capital, international, the, you know, in, incompetent international institutions and so, on, so forth. And I'm very happy to be here in Bristol. And you're right, Bristol is a very, you know, privileged, not privileged, but a beautiful, beautiful city. So uh, I hope Bristol will be leading the way when it comes to uh, a more, I would say, um, a more dignified democratic system. Okay, thank you. And Lola, you, you work in the arts in a pretty unique city as well, Lagos, and elsewhere in, in Nigeria. Tell us about the importance of the arts to, to cities from your perspective. Thank you so much. I am very happy to be here. Um, just on the way here, I was talking to my daughter who took her LNAT exam today, and she kept telling me she wanted to come to Bristol. <laughs> My memories of Bristol are from um, when I was eight years old, going to a school called the Collegiate in Winterbourne. But just walking around and coming here from the other venue, I have to say that I did say to her, you know what, I understand why you want to come to the University of Bristol. I understand why you want to live in Bristol because it's truly beautiful. And being here and listening um, to the mayor has also had a huge impact on me because I work in Nigeria and I live in Nigeria and um, when you when you live in a in a country that's struggling with all sorts of issues you know there's a way in which just to be able to smile you have to kind of manage your standards you know, you sometimes have to, you know, lower them so that, like I said, you actually have reason to be proud of the work that you're doing. But the real reason that I'm happy is that seeing what's going on here, especially that really inspiring video, which we loved, <laughs> We Are Bristol, you know, it just made me think there's so much great work that needs to be done. So I organized two festivals, one in Lagos, the Ake Arts and Book Festival, and one in northern Nigeria in a place called Kaduna, I don't know if anybody's heard of Kaduna. No? Yeah? Okay, one person. You're coming to the festival. I'm going to force him down. So, um, so Kaduna State, um, six, to, six to seven million people, um, has had its fair share of, of ethnic and religious violence. And all the people that I was speaking to, um, the people that I would you know, encounter in schools when I was doing a bit of development work, would always talk about the great cultural activities that had taken place there, but it was always in the past tense. It was always 50 years ago. This used to be a hub, a cultural hub. I mean, 50 years ago? Okay, so what have you done about it? 
So a man from Kaduna came to the Ake Festival in the south, and he said to me after, he said, you know, we need something like this in northern Nigeria. And I said, yes, you do need something like this in northern Nigeria. But hey, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. As um, luck would have it, two years later, he was um, elected as governor of Kaduna State. And within the first week, he called me and said, do you remember that conversation we had? We need an arts festival, a book festival in Kaduna State. So for me, the journey has been um, kind of life-changing because I, I hear the, what the mayor is saying about confronting complexity. Um, how do you deal with a, a place where the young people have access to the technology and the information that you have access to in the West, but they live in this uber hyper conservative society um, where in some quarters, anything that has to do with the arts and culture is seen as haram. Um, so they've got all these voices and all this talent and all this expression that's just bursting to come out. And that's what we've been able to harness at the Kaduna Festival. It's giving them a platform. It's giving them confidence. It's valuing talent. All the parents want them to be doctors and lawyers, and of course for the girls to be teachers and nurses. Uh, this is a true conversation I had with a man whose daughter wanted to become an engineer, and he said, no, 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 it's not ladylike. She, she should become a teacher, you know? And, but now they see investig investigative journalists who are women, and they go and talk to them and say, I want, I want to be like you. They see poets and they're thinking, I want to do that. So having um, the introduction of culture in this society has had such an incredible impact. Um, but you know, the best news for me was a conversation I had after the edition that we just um, concluded about four weeks ago, where the governor said, um, so how long has this been going on now? I said, three years, you know that. And he said, mm, and we've had to go to a different location each time. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, we need some sort of infrastructure to house culture and to give a space and provide a space all year round for the young people of Kaduna State. And at that point, I thought, job done. <laughs> so um, it's great what's going on here. And I, can, I will be looking out. I'm going to try and see if I can actually get the governor to come here. I think he would be inspired by you too. And I am definitely stealing that. We are Bristol thing. We're going to be doing. <laughs> we are Kaduna. <laughs> Sounds you. more stronger. <laughs> um, I wanted to pursue just a little bit more this idea that cities can do things that nation states have abandoned. And um, not on particular issues. And I'd start with you, Tony. Um, do you really think that cities can overcome, you know, the, the, the problems we've got in, in national politics and failing international institutions? I, I, well, I don't think cities alone can do it, and I don't think cities alone can even solve their own lo the, all the problems that are local. They don't mm. even have jurisdiction many times over all the different. Mm. Uh, issues and dimensions of, of progress that they're trying to help stimulate. However, I think there is an issue of, uh, part of what we're talking about here is an issue of leadership. And when we're even talking about sort of loss of trust in institutions, at least in the U.S., when you look at those trust institutions, local governments pull far higher yeah. than state and yeah. national government does right yeah. now. And it is because of that closeness to the people that I think Sheila was talking about. Uh, Sheila talked about sort of changes in global governance, cities themselves banding together collectively to have a collective voice on policy issues globally. Uh, and the mayor talked about even a model of governance here locally of bringing many different stakeholders in the city together in a combined vision to push on the same things, measure the same way, hold institutions collectively accountable. And I do think in this I think touches on a little bit of the, the conversation about democracy and a little bit of the conversation of culture. In that 
bringing together different stakeholders. We're here in a university. Um, there are businesses that are uh, participating with government. There's philanthropy. There's civil society. That sort of placed base, the, the place being um, a location that brings these different stakeholders together around a combined vision, I think can help exercise our ways of bridging divides and coming up with solutions to very complex problems that have trade-offs um, that have to be dealt with. Uh, it isn't easy when you, you know, when you make a decision to go green, it can have implications for jobs and, and what that means for, for people as well. And so having to balance all of that is challenging. But doing it together, as a community together, and finding some solutions, uh, I think helps that identity that we were talking about, helps build that identity, identity helps evolve it, from where its history might have been to where you might be going in the future, and also helps build our muscles around democracy as well. I like to say that in the US, our national politics do not reflect at all what's going on in our local communities. There is lots of things happening in local communities where political divisions are set aside to actually solve problems in neighborhoods, in communities. And what we have to do is get to a place where that bottom-up momentum starts to be reflected in the state and national conversations that we're having. And I think cities have a real role to play in that. We have a similar problem in this country of national politics yeah. as against what's happening locally. Um, Sheila, which good examples would you give of cities in the states that have got their act together, really, in, this, in a similar way to here? So there are lots of examples, in part because there's lots of leadership like you have here. Um, and I would say that, just following up on what he said, I mean, we have to understand we're moving from a system of governments to a system of governance in which, um, you know, there used to be one actor that controlled everything, whether it's the international level that speaks downward or the national level that speaks down to cities. And really what we see is a move to um, to really complicate that picture. And a lot of cities and mayors are playing a role in that for the simple fact that, there are, that in an innovative society, which we've moved to, there are so many different actors that have a lot to contribute to the problems that need solving. And there are universities, there are the private sector, um, local entrepreneurs and innovators, et cetera. So the best leaders in America on the city, whether it's Mayor Mike Bloomberg, who was the mayor of New York, or uh, Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles, or Nan Whaley in Dayton, where there was just an awful mass shooting. What they've done is that they've harnessed, I think, the capacity of actors within their cities to work together, like the New York City Mayor's Panel on Climate Change that I just uh, sat on for three years, right? Bloomberg did it and now de Blasio. And what they've done is bring together people, both community, scientists, experts, and industry to look at this issue of climate through the lens of complexity, at the neighborhood level, through the lens of equity, and figure out how a city like New York City can adapt to climate change, taking into account a lot of different factors. So the best mayors, Nan Daly, the gun issue. In America, violence is hitting cities terribly. 70% of the American public want background checks, want to ban assault weapons. Congress does nothing. So it's up to mayors to figure out how to do this, even as states and national governments are preempting them. They pass a law, they get slapped back. So creativity and innovation is happening at the local level because mayors are saying, we've got the private sector, we've got these other folks, we can work with them to get this done. And the same that's happening from the local level up to the international level. Do you see this in Nigeria, in cities in Nigeria, Lola? It's a very different system, of course. And um, we, d we actually d don't have mayors. Mm. I'm, I'm beginning to think maybe we need them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but that, we have um, what we call local government, government chairmen, yeah. Yeah. you know, and um, I'm already in my mind thinking, God, if we had a mayor, how would that work? You know, how would they, um, would there be any kind of separation of, of duties and what sort of conflict mm. would come out of that? Well, I come from the conflict, actually. It's interesting. 
uh, I just arrived from Palermo. And Palermo is actually acting against the laws by, you know, welcoming the refugees. Uh, my week has been full of mayors, actually. You're my second mayor, I'm sorry. Uh, I was presented by the honorary citizenship because of How to Lose a Country, the book. And the mayor actually invited me to, you know, um, see a boat and so on, and we couldn't do that. But then one thing was very interesting, and it's about identity issue as well. He was actually, um, you know, was doing something against the law in order to protect the identity of the city as an embracing, welcoming place. And then I went to a museum that was another interesting thing about identity, and it, it might be interesting for Bristol as well. Um, I saw the first written document of Europe, uh, an agreement between two tribes or something. And it was, both, uh, it was written both in Arabic and in Greek. So identity of Europe is not something that the, you know, br br some people in Brussels uh, talk about or they're trying to determine something that's called way of life in Europe and so on. And it's a fluid thing and it changes every day. And Palermo actually looks like Beirut uh, rather than an Italian city. So uh, when Mayor was talking, he mentioned all the names from all around the world. So Bristol is such a place and its identity is changing due to the interesting times we're going through. And sometimes, yes, uh, people, you know, cities, not necessarily should be against the law, but maybe beyond the law, which is in this case, you know, concerning, mm. considering what England is, Britain is going through, I think it's something that is uh, quite possible and would be really understandable. <laughs> Let's see where we get to. Um, and Bruno, just the kind of leadership you see in those new cities is very different, isn't it? The it's, it's from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, everything is very planned. Everything is very organized. In Forest City, for example, there are when you arrive, you realize that there are very clearly three classes in the city. There are the cleaners and the construction workers that come mostly from Bangladesh. There are the security officers that come from Nepal. Uh, and there are the residents, mostly from China. Those of you who know Plato's Republic will recognize the pattern. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is that kind of world where everything is meant to satisfy your wishes uh, as a, one of the, uh, the privileged residents of the city. And if you don't like it, you can even complain to the management. So it's a different idea of a city that, from the one we have. Um, but let me say quickly that I, I think uh, cities are more responsive. I always notice how mayors are so passionate about climate change. I used to be a, a government minister. When I, when I dealt with national ministers, I never saw that passion. Why? Because for national politicians, it all looks like pain and effort for something you will get 40 years from now. Mm -hmm. Whereas for local politicians, it seems already like a project uh, of housing for 2,000 people, which might be ready four years from now when we can all see it. It's more visible, it's more tangible. And, and we are human beings. It's very difficult for us to accept pain for 40 years with nothing at the end, which is how sometimes climate change struggle looks like. At the local, like, uh, local level, it looks more human. And I want to ask one, each of you one final question, which is the, the one the mayor talked about at the end, which is about being a city of hope and, and what that would mean in your particular area or your particular city or your particular place of work. And I'm going to start with, with Tony which gives the others a chance to think about it, I'm afraid. <laughs> you, can, you, can, right, you can pause a little bit if you want. and then. So, so I've got to think on my feet right yeah. away. I'm going to think out loud. Well, I love the way in which he um, framed hope as also recognizing the challenges. Um, so being forward-looking and uh, what, what you aspire to, but also being honest about where you've come from and where you are right now. And I do think that um, the, the cities that are doing this well are using data and a sense of objectivity and measurement to understand that. 
but only using that as the basis also for that sort of level of governance we were just talking about. Then to bring the community together to say, what are we gonna do about it? And who are we going to be together and evolve to, to together? Uh, but I think it has to be that clear-eyed um, assessment up front uh, to, to also be honest about where you really want to aspire to going forward. Lola? Um, I think when I, when I look at, um, again, at, at, at this festival um, that I'm talking about in northern Nigeria, um, before um, I started curating it, I traveled around a little bit, um, going into schools, um, taking lots of books, um, picture books by British uh, writers, and I took them into the school, and I wanted to read to the children who were in primary three, and um, they'd never seen a picture book. So I can't remember which book I was reading, and I suddenly saw, okay, there's a dinosaur, and it's pink, and it's talking, no, that's not gonna work, because they're so far removed from that. I mean, you take for granted here, when you grow up with stories and you're seeing the depiction you know, in books, and it prompted me to take a decision to, um, to, to write books with proper illustrations, but books where the children would see themselves and their realities reflected because I understand now fully. I heard it in theory, but it wasn't until I had that experience that I really understood it. For me, hope, my hope is it's a very simple thing. I just want Nigerian children to be able to read, and I want them to have material to read. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Eche. Um, I have been repeating this, and I have to stop it, actually. Uh, hope is not my favorite word. I, actually, I don't like the word hope, because um, personally, I've seen incidents, and I've read stories where actually there is no hope. Hmm. Hope is a very slippery word. It's an extremely fragile word, word, and times are too hard for words like hope sometimes. I am more for the word determination uh, because you cannot, you can take away the hope from people, but you cannot take away the determination of creating beauty. Once I've been told a story by one of my editors, uh, she was a Jew and her grandmother and her grandfather met in a concentration camp uh, and her grandfather fell in love with this young man, young woman, and then she, he couldn't find anything to give her, so she, he found a little cabbage, and he put it on a stick, and he gave her this little cabbage, and then she fell in love with him as well. So uh, this story always amazes me, because there is the determination of creating beauty here with the cabbage, and also there is a determination of seeing the beauty in the cabbage. So, uh, I believe this, uh, this aspect uh, of hu humans, which is inherent, this creating beauty and believing in beauty and determination of creating and believing in beauty. And even there is no hope sometimes, it's always there. So I think uh, I would rather co go for determination, but then I understand why people need hope. Uh, but then still, one has to be careful when using the word hope because it also makes people very lazy. Sometimes I do think that we are living in a time when everybody, where everybody asks for hope, but then everybody thinks, I hope there's no hope so we can relax. <laughs> okay, well, we, we might need another plaque on City Hall, I think. <laughs> um, um, Bruno? Uh, 
well, I think uh, when we talk about hope and a vision for the future, we have immediately to talk about democracy because in the end it cannot be my vision or your vision or even our vision here. It has to be everyone's vision. So we have to build the channels by which all these voices can come together and be aggregated. What I thought was very interesting about tonight, uh, and I don't know if it's common to other cities in the UK, were at least the two ways in which Bristol is trying to do this. The youth mayors, by the way, did an incredible job. I don't exactly. know where they are. They're gone. They've, they've, they've gone to bed. They're too young. I don't know how it works, but I imagine the youth mayors would meet with the mayor twice a month or once a month and uh, convey concerns from their cohort and not only from their cohort. And then the, the city poet who goes around the city and listens to stories and then writes a poem about those stories and reads it here for the rest of the citizens. Be very interesting to develop these channels even more and to deepen them because the traditional channels of voting every four years are no longer enough. Okay, good. That gives us a, a special boost for when we recruit the next city poet. Um, Sheila, final word on hope with you. Sure. So it's hard for me to think about hope and hopelessness without uh, thinking about what's happening in my country right now. We're going through a legal, moral, constitutional crisis. And I remember when, speaking of youth, I so have a 15-year-old son. He'll be 15. The night of the election in 2016, he stayed up half the night. He kept waking up. What's happening? What's happening? He was 12. You know, did Hillary win? Did Hillary win? And so, you know, finally had to say, unfortunately, Trump won. And his first word, he looked at me and he said, he's going to take us back to slavery. Now, I knew that wasn't possible. Maybe it is, actually. But, I've ne but to have a son who lived through Barack Obama and then went to Trump and to see the pride and hope in his eyes when he accompanied me to the polls to vote for Obama and the sheer fear when Trump got elected um, was a transformative moment. But what I've seen since then, in spite of our crisis, is him going to the climate march mm. and to the march for our lives and the youth and everyone that I know looking inside to say, this is our democracy. You know, and even Obama said this, actually, we looked at our biggest mistake was to put, to, to leave it to one person to save us. But even he said, this is, you have to take care of this, not just me, right? And so we're being tested now to take care of our democracy, our principles and our values, and the leaders that can harness this energy in these youth today will be the ones that will shepherd us to, I think, our new world. So my son gives me hope, the youth give me hope, and leaders like Marvin definitely give me hope. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... That's... Uh... We have to end it there. We're out of time. Before thanking our speakers, I just wanted to thank a, a few others. Thanks, of course, to the University of Bristol for hosting, I couldn't quite believe it's the seventh State of the City Address, but there we are. We've been honoured to work with them throughout this whole programme. Um, I'd also like to thank some of the supporters of the Festival of the Future City, particularly the British Council, our international partner, who not only have supported being able to bring over speakers such as we've got tonight, but also allowed us to appoint Eche as our writer in residence for the festival. And if I urge you to do anything, it's to get down to Watershed tomorrow to visit the festival bookstore and read Eche's books and read Bruno's books and read the other books that we've got of speakers uh, down there. I'd also like to thank our partner university, the University of the West of England for the Festival of the Future City, and also our, the British Film Institute for being our film partner. There are more events coming up in Festival of the Future City tomorrow and on Friday. We're covering issues of green cities tomorrow, issues of democracy and, um, and devolution. And tomorrow in this building, we have the annual Cabot lecture on how we can thrive as an urban species. Um, and finally, if you haven't had a chance, because we, it, it, we could only run it today, but I saw a fantastic project today in Watershed, which was a trailer for a project called Cargo which is looking at the diaspora, the slave trade, uh, and much more, particularly the positive stories in Bristol and internationally now 
um, about our citizens. And I thought it was fantastic. And it'll be on College Green next summer. So do watch out for that as well. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the Mayor for the State of the City Address. Thank you to the Youth Mayors. Thank you to Vanessa. And thank you to Tony, Bruno, Eche, Lola, and Sheila. Thank you very much. Thank you.